Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to our presentation today, which is called Using the Trumsa Recommendations to Cite Data in Language Work. Before we start, I want to take a moment to thank our many co-authors on this presentation, whose names you can see here, and also let you know that you'll be hearing from three of us today. I'm Andrea Berez Croker, and we'll also hear from Helena Andreasen and Lauren Gaughan. Okay, so today we're going to be telling you about a document called the Thrumsa Recommendations for Citation of Research Data in Linguistics. This is a document that was completed a little over a year ago in late 2019 that addresses the problem shown here on the slide. That language and linguistics data sets are often not cited or not cited well because of confusion about the proper methods for doing so. This means then that among other problems that not citing language data brings, all of the people involved in creating language data are not receiving the recognition for their efforts that they should be receiving. The Trumsa recommendations then show us all how to cite data and the people involved in language work. First though, let me define a few terms from the title of our presentation so that we're all on the same page. So what do we mean when we say language work here? Well, we like a definition that's shown here from Leonard 2017 that language work is an umbrella expression to include language documentation, description, teaching, advocacy, and resource development. Basically everything that we ICLDC participants do. Another term to define is data. And so what do we mean by data in language work? Well, data here means all samples of language, things like recordings and written language, that are examples of words, sentences, verbal art, storytelling, oration, singing, and all of the other ways that we use language to communicate with one another. And importantly, while the term data can seem on its own to be a rather depersonalizing term, we actually mean it here to be uh, quite a personalizing and very human term. Uh, and that's because people create language data and contribute to language data, and it needs to be recognized that data in language work is precious for exactly that reason, because language work is all about people. And finally, what do we mean by citing that data? Well, as we know, the people involved in language work come from a wide background, right? They can be fluent speakers or learners or elders or youth or teachers or parents or grandparents and so forth. And all of these people, no matter what their background is, deserve to be thanked, credited and acknowledged for their contributions in language work. And one way we can do that is through citation. And citation is very familiar for anyone who's ever written a paper or even a school book report, right? We cite and therefore acknowledge and thank publications all the time. Let me show you some examples of what I mean. So here are a couple of examples of typical citations that you'll see at the end of papers and books. And note that the authors of these publications get credit and that's credit that they deserve. Um, and in the first citation, you'll also see that even the editors of the book that this chapter was published in also get credit for their work. And again, they deserve credit for their contributions. But yet inside of many linguistics and language publications, there may be samples from language, that is language data, that once upon a time were shared by one person, the speaker or the signer, with another person, let's say a researcher, and that sample of language data may have been translated by yet another person, and still another person may have been the one in charge of writing it down. But unfortunately, all of these people don't often get acknowledged for their contributions to the data. And we've actually talked about this before. At the 2015 ICLDC, and then later in a 2017 paper, several of us and a couple of other authors then talked about how language documenters don't really do a good job of citing language data. And this means that we aren't giving proper credit to the people involved in language work. And why is that? Well, it's because in our linguistics publication traditions, we don't have a history of requiring it. We do have a history of requiring the citation of other publications. And in fact, we call it plagiarism when we don't cite a publication properly, but we don't have a name for it when we fail to cite data. Back then, we were mainly concerned about the effects of the lack of data citation on the science of linguistics and the idea that it's very difficult to make valid scientific claims when the data those claims are based on aren't locatable or verifiable. And that's still true. And what this table here is showing us is that by and large, most, most authors of descriptive grammars do not cite data sufficiently. That's what the tall leftmost bar there shows. Today, however, we're concerned about another problem that comes from the failure to cite data properly. And that's the effect it has on people. When we don't cite data, we don't acknowledge the contributions of people. And those people can serve a lot of roles in language work. This slide shows just some of the roles that all the people involved in language work can have, 
In addition to the author and the editor, of course, we also have speakers and signers and translators and recorders and data inputters and compilers and developers and so on and so forth. So this raises the question, if so many different people contribute to language data, why aren't we giving proper credit to these people through proper citation? Hi, everyone. This is Helena Andreasen speaking. As Andrea said, we are expected to cite all the sources that we use, and this is a well-established practice when it comes to written publications. And it's quite easy to do as well, because there is a multitude of style manuals that we can consult if we are unsure about which details to include in our citations. With data, it's different. First of all, there are few, if any, manuals that explain how to build citations for different types of data. This is of course a problem, but an even more serious problem is that we are not fully aware of the importance of why data should be cited in the first place. In the last decade, we have witnessed a growing concern around the lack of proper data citations, and many initiatives have been taken around the world to tackle this issue. In 2017, a group of linguists joined forces and established an interest group for linguistic data within the Research Data Alliance, which is an international organization that aims to build social and technical infrastructure to enable open sharing and reuse of data. Ever since the beginning, the intention of the Linguistics Data Interest Group has been to function as a scholar-led, community-based project which draws on the expertise and experience of its members and their local networks. By working this way, the idea has been to raise awareness in the community around good practices in research data management and to receive input and feedback from members working with different types of language data. Two key publications have come out of the collaborative work so far, the Austin Principles and the Trumpse Recommendations. The Austin Principles of Data Citation in Linguistics were created as a means to raise awareness among linguists and to encourage them to make informed decisions regarding the visibility and transparency of their research data. Even if general principles already existed out there, we wanted to have a document that speaks directly to the linguist who wants to learn and work in line with good research data management practices. We built the Austin principles using the structure and content of the more general Force 11 data citation principles, and principle number two talks explicitly about credit and attribution. I encourage you to pause the video here and read the text in white. In order to help linguists work in line with the Austin principles, the second task of the Linguistics Data Interest Group was to create a document that could serve as a practical guide to citation of linguistic data. The end product was a rather comprehensive document containing templates for in-text citations and bibliographic references, detailed explanations of all elements included in these templates, and quite a few examples illustrating how linguistic data citations may look like. Throughout the document, we have tried to highlight issues that are important and in some cases specific to linguistic data. As I said earlier, one goal has been to engage the scholarly community in our work. And what we did, both with the Austin Principles and the Trumpser recommendations, was to invite members of the interest group to contribute in the development of the documents. For the Trumpser recommendations, we organized two rounds of asynchronous meetings where people could comment directly into the draft and it was immensely rewarding to witness people having long discussions in the document comments field. We also sent out a pre-final draft of the recommendations to a list of selected linguistic data experts, journal editors and leaders in the field who were in a position to encourage adoption or endorsement of the document. The recommendations were published in 2019 with the aim to provide practical and concise advice for data citation that takes into account the enormous diversity of linguistic data. We have identified three main target groups for the recommendations. One intended audience is the academic publishers who have the possibility to add the recommendations to the author guidelines. The document the document will also serve researchers who want to cite data, and it might be particularly relevant in the case the publisher guidelines are unspecified. 
The recommendations will also be useful to researchers who want to deposit data, as it may help them determine. Finally, data repositories should have a look at the document, because it contains information about which metadata and citation elements that are crucial in order for the data in their repository to be properly citable. The published document is split into three main parts. The first part focuses on bibliographic references, and the second part focuses on in-text citations, while the third part contains explanations of the terms used in the templates. The document contains examples of how to cite full datasets and also how to cite only parts of datasets. The recommendations don't say anything about formatting or citation style, but the idea is that the templates that we provide should be flexible enough to fit with different journal style sheets. In the introduction, Andrea underlined that people who contribute in language work should be credited for what they've done, and the Tromsø recommendations allow you to do just that. In this example, we have data published in Paradisec, and there is one person credited in the author field, Alexander Adelar. The parentheses inserted after the name show that he has been the collector of the data. Let's have a look at a couple of other examples. In the Hawk dataset, published in the Kaipuleone language archive, we see that the person listed first in the author field, Bryn Hawk, is identified as the researcher and also as the one who has deposited the dataset to the archive. Two other persons are credited in the same field. Omar Papashvili is the speaker who has contributed with the data. Arezzo Orbetishvili has functioned as consultant. In the second example, we find data published in the Alaska Native Language Archive. And again, three persons are credited in the author field. Michael E. Krause and Jeff Lear are identified as the interviewers while Anna Nelson Harry is identified as the speaker. So as you can see, we are able to define rather precisely how the different persons listed in the reference have contributed to the published data. In the third example on this slide, you see an example of an in-text citation where the speaker of the relevant data point is identified. Being this detailed is important because it helps the reader of the citation to identify where in the data set the specific data point can be found. Before I pass the word on to Lauren Gon, I just wanted to say that it might be useful to have a look at a couple of the guiding documents that exist out there, especially if you're not too familiar with the terminology and how the different roles are defined. For instance, the CASRI Contributor Role Taxonomy focuses on the roles people may have in the different stages of a research project, while the OLAC Role Vocabulary which is targeted towards language and linguistic research, focuses more narrowly on roles related to data. Thanks, Helena. Now that Andrea has introduced us to the motivations behind the Tromso recommendations, and Helena has given us a brief overview of the T-Rec, we can think about how you might better cite your data and give people the recognition for their work in your own practice. The first and most important thing you can do as someone who works in language documentation and conservation is to cite your own data in your own work. That helps us work towards normalizing the practice of citing linguistic data. The very best time to build data citation into your work is at the beginning of projects, when you're beginning to develop the way that you name files and manage data. But the second best time to start is today. The citing of data is separate from the practice of building an available corpus, but they're not completely unrelated because citation coexists with archiving that is ethical and allows people to access sensitively language documentation materials. So in order to cite your data, the best way to do that is to have a corpus available on one of the archives, but they're actually distinct processes. And we know people who work in language documentation have been building detailed and large corpora that are well-structured and available often through online portals these days. The citation practice allows us to recognize that those corpora and all the people who worked on them are, are accessible underlying the document that you're writing at this particular moment. And following on from citing your own data, continuing the practice to citing other people's linguistic data if you use their examples of language in your work. The Tromso recommendations include instructions for how to cite a single example or how to cite an entire corpus. 
If your work involves supervising or managing projects with other people on them, you have the ability to encourage best practice. We know that being a PhD student and writing a dissertation involves a lot of specific skills within the topic that the candidate is writing their dissertation in. But we also know that when you do a PhD, you acquire a whole range of other skills and practices uh, that are beyond just the specific topic that any one student is working on. So introducing your students to the best practice of data citation or introducing um, the people working on your project as you're building a corpus together is one of the best ways to encourage and normalize data citation. For example, the University of Hawaii since 2013 has included data citation as an expectation as part of graduating doing any kind of linguistic analysis in a dissertation. Publishers can also normalize data citation by making it an expectation as part of the publishing process. The Tromso recommendations have been written in a way to make them easy to adopt by any journal or publication. Many of you are probably already familiar with documents like the generic style rules for linguistics, which explains how to format a journal article for a linguistics publication or the Leipzig glossing rules, which have helped to standardize the way that we create interlinear glossing with examples. The Austin principles and the Tromsø recommendations are designed to work alongside that in order to give journals the tools to help people cite their data better. The Australian Journal of Linguistics recently adopted the Austin Principles and T-Rex alongside the generic style rules and Leipzig glossing rules. I know many people who work in documentation or conservation are also members of journal editorial boards or maybe editors of journals themselves, and we're very happy to work directly with you to support you including the Tromsø recommendations into your journal's style sheet. Another institutional structure that can help people cite their data better are the archives and digital collections where language workers archive their data. Data managers can encourage people to cite their own work or the data of someone else that they are looking at by providing training and support to encourage citation. On this slide, I've included an example from Paradisec, which provides a cite as field on all pages of the archive so that you can find either the citation for the entire collection or the citation for a specific bundle of data. These kind of tools reduce the effort that it takes people to cite their data, makes it a lot easier. All of the suggestions that I've made above are about normalizing data citation in language work. The documentation and reclamation of language is about people. It's people who speak language, it's people who are actively doing this work, it's people who make language records. By properly citing linguistic data, it is one of the small ways that we can give credit to everyone involved and make the process more transparent. In order to make this process easier, the Tromsø recommendations provide lots of practical examples and really clear advice for how to cite linguistic data across a range of contexts. Here you'll find references to the documents we've cited throughout this talk, and we'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge our many co-authors, both for this presentation today, but also for the Tromsø recommendations and everyone who's been involved in the Linguistic Data Interest Group. Thank you to everyone who has helped us put together the Tromsø recommendations and who has been working actively to cite their data. You can find links to the Tromsø recommendations, these slides, and all the other work of the Linguistic Data Interest Group below this video. Thank you so much for your time in watching this video. If you're watching this as part of ICLDC7, we look forward to seeing you in the Q&A session. Otherwise, you can always get in touch with the Linguistic Data Interest Group.